but before we get started, a few housekeeping issues. Please note that this webinar will be recorded. Throughout this event, if you have questions for the speakers, you are very welcome to raise them at any time during the presentation through the Q&A function. We will address your questions during the Q&A session before the closing of this webinar. When sending your questions, please provide the names of the presenters to whom you wish to ask your question, and also please provide your name, email address, and affiliation. In case time does not permit us to address all questions, the RDH team will follow up with you after the webinar via email. Now, we have a packed agenda for this event, so let's get started. I first invite Ms. Sarah Lou Ariola to give the opening remarks and a little bit about Sarah. As a former Undersecretary of the Migrant Workers Affairs, uh, Sarah safeguarded the rights of 10 million overseas Filipinos. She led repatriation efforts during the crises as Chief Negotiator for the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. And Sarah has also been recognized for her outstanding contributions. Uh, she's received the Gawad Mabini Grand Cross Award, and it's my pleasure to hand over to Sarah for her remarks. Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much, Tawanda. De dear partners and colleagues, good afternoon from Bangkok. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the launch of the IOM Regional Data Hub's Asia-Pacific Migration Data Report 2022. Today, the Regional Data Hub team will present the latest evidence on migration trends and dynamics in the region. We are also delighted to be joined by the distinguished panel of leading experts who will discuss with us emerging topics and pathways to strengthening the evidence-based migration governance. Inhabited by nearly half of the world's population, the Asia-Pacific region is characterized by interesting yet complex migratory patterns that play a significant role in the economic, social, and demographic development in the region. Three years after its outbreak, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have effects on the population's most vulnerable groups, including migrants from and across the region. Although countries in Asia and the Pacific have witnessed a gradual resumption of international mobility, Migrants' pre-existing vulnerabilities were exacerbated by the pandemic, leading to persistent challenges in terms of health, employment, security, and housing, among others. In particular, migrant workers, especially those lacking regular status, continue to be disproportionately exposed to unfair pay, long working hours, forced labor, and other forms of exploitation. While some countries in the region face new risks, such as the alarming rise of online scamming for human trafficking and forced labor in Southeast Asia, others continue to experience the enduring consequences of conflict and disasters. For example, persecution and conflict continue to fuel displacement in some countries in the region, and disasters related to climate change have led to the internal displacement of millions of people in countries like Pakistan, the Philippines, China, and Bangladesh. However, despite of these challenges, it is important to recognize the efforts made by governments and stakeholders in the region in implementing global frameworks such as the Sustainable Development Goals and the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, including better emergency preparedness plans, relief measures, and the provision of social support and services extended to migrants during crisis. These efforts demonstrate their commitment to finding lasting solutions to address the complex issues faced by migrant communities. Consequently, having accurate, accessible, and detailed migration data becomes imperative to comprehend the complex migratory patterns in the region effectively. I am pleased to note that the Asia-Pacific Migration Data Report 2022 marks the third of the series of the Regional Data Hub's annual flagship publication, which collects and analyzes the latest data and information of the migration landscape in the region across various themes. The report contributes to strengthening the regional evidence base on migration. 
Not only does it achieve this by compiling migration data from international, regional, national data sources, but also by analyzing and contextualizing such data into the socioeconomic situation of the countries in the Asia Pacific region. The report also aspires to offer timely recommendations in a fast changing post pandemic reality and reviews the progress of the region has made in 2022 towards global goals such as the sustainable development goals and the objectives of the global compact for safe orderly and regular migration. Here, I would like to highlight that despite the scarcity, inconsistencies, limitations, and other gaps in the context of migration data in the region, the Regional Data Hub has built up and continues to advance our work in this challenging task. Additionally, the Regional Data Hub's work through its newly developed website, which we will be introduced more detail today, will provide a new tool to inform policy and programs and to connect our cross-thematic work both at the country and regional level. Therefore, I extend my appreciation to the Data Hub team for their productive and insightful work, as well as our invited experts and colleagues for their contributions. I am confident the Migration Data Report will promote further discussion and action in the region with the aim of facilitating safe, orderly, regular, and responsible migration of people through evidence-based migration policies. The IUM Regional Office of Asia for Asia and the Pacific remain steadfast in our commitment to working with government partners and the international community to strengthen our collective efforts in this direction. I wish you a very successful launch event. Thank you very much, Kapkunika. Thank you very much, Sarah, for those remarks. Um, at this stage, I would like to invite our second uh, speaker, uh, I now invite Dr. Coco Warner to give her opening remarks. Uh, a little bit about uh, Coco. Coco has worked in the United Nations for over 16 years, directing research on climate change and migration and climate risk management at the United Nations University before joining the Secretariat uh, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UN triple, UNFCCC. Prior to joining the UN system, Coco was a researcher at the ETH Zurich working on comprehensive risk management in Davos, Switzerland. Coco received her PhD in economics from the University of Vienna as a Fulbright Fellow while working at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. I now invite Coco to provide her opening remarks. Coco, over to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the kind introduction and Sarah Liu really appreciate being here together with you and your teams and for your introductory remarks. We're gathered here to um, hear the launch of a really important um, report from the Asia Pacific region. First and foremost, congratulations to the regional data hub on this remarkable effort to consolidate the expertise of researchers, analysts, and technical experts um, in, in bringing together this report. Your contributions have enriched our understanding over the years about migration and displacement in the Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific region. Um, the Regional Data Hub's analysis, as all of you know, contribute to data-driven policy and programmatic responses, both in the region as well as globally. Let's start by considering some of the challenges affecting governments, communities, and especially migrants and displaced communities in the region. We know that climate change the Migration Data Report from last year, or 2022, highlights that last year, the Asia-Pacific region experienced a staggering 22.5 million internal displacements caused by weather-related hazards. That is 70 of all disaster-related displacement worldwide. Operational and operational issue and very disruptive for the affected communities. The escalating frequency and intensity of these weather-related hazards exacerbate other challenges faced by communities in the region and demand immediate collective action and data-driven responses. We also know that we need a solid data and analysis base to assess progress towards the sustainable development goals and also to translate the Global Compact for Migration into results. 
in the face of multiple global challenges, a prominent one of which concerns climate change and mobility, we must build on we must build an ecosystem of global, regional, and national data and analysis. IOM understands these challenges and has committed to build a commensurate data system. That is why over the past years, IOM has set up regional data hubs like the one here in the Asia Pacific to analyze migration and displacement trends. IOM also recently, recently established the Global Data Institute, of which I'm the director, to enhance the av availability and use of data to deliver on the promise of migration while supporting the world's most vulnerable populations. The Migration Data Report 2022 for the Asian Pacific region is an example of IOM's commitment to data-driven decision-making and using accessible, consolidated data at the regional level to understand migration trends. This report highlights migration types and challenges faced by migrants as well as displaced communities. It also highlights the importance of collaboration with governments and with international community and affected communities to drive meaningful insight from data. We're so excited that you've joined us at the release of this third edition of the Migration Data Report. For those in the data community, we need to keep working towards standardization of our data so that we can analyze it in a timely way. By harnessing the power of data, we can focus attention and inform specific actions that address these challenges and build a safe, orderly future for migrants and all the communities they're connected with. And for those of you making data-driven decisions, we're so grateful for your participation and we'd appreciate feedback so that our data and analysis contributes effectively to building an inclusive, sustainable, and respectful world for migrants and host communities alike. I'm now very pleased to hand it over to my colleagues who will present their findings from the region. Thank you and over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Warner, for the opening remarks. Uh, the next set of speakers from the IOM Asia Pacific Regional Data Hub or RDH will take us through highlights from the Asia Pacific Migration Data Report 2022. So first up, we'll have Chanda Nayak, who is the head of the IOM Asia Pacific Regional Data Hub. He will introduce us to the RDH and this report. He's joined by the RDH research and analysis team, who will then present the key findings from the report. And within the team, we have Dr. Annie Yip Chin Yu, the regional Migration Data Analysis Research Officer, Gabriela Alvarez Sanchez, uh, Regional Data Analyst, Jasmine Tam, RDH's Support Officer, as well as Barbara Porovecchio, RDH's Reporting Officer. Now over to Chandan to take us through the first portion uh, of the report. Over to you, Chandan. Thanks, Tawanda, and hello, everyone. As Tawanda said, I'm Chandan, and I lead the IOM Asia Pacific uh, Regional Data Hub. And I extend my sincere gratitude to each of you for being a part of this launch webinar. And thank you, Sarah and Coco, for those valuable insights. It's this kind of collaboration that truly makes a difference. And that's precisely what the Regional Data Hub, or RDH, is all about, bringing data community from UN agencies, government partners, and stakeholders together in an effort on strengthening migration data and understanding migration in this dynamic region. Today, as you all know, is the presentation of our annual flagship migration data report. This report is more than just facts and figures. We believe it's a powerful tool and evidence-based guide to understanding migration trends in our vibrant region. As in the previous years, I will start with a quick intro to the RDH and the MDR before our team dives into the best part of the presentation, the fascinating details of the report. Um, in recent decades, we have observed a surge in volume of migration data collected by various stakeholders. However, we found that all those wealth of information has remained 
largely scattered and not well organized. This means that we need a reliable, nuanced, and harmonized evidence base that can show what's happening with migration in the region, both now and in the past, help us make policy and carry out our operations, and above all, provide common people good information about migration. And RDH is responding exactly to this need. We want to put together information from this region, use the numbers to get quantitative insights, harmonize data processes, and encourage good data practices. The RDH, as you may know, is an unit within IOM's Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, created in July 2020, alongside IOM's Global Migration Data Strategy, or MDS, which was designed with bigger IOM strategic vision. As such, our key objectives are on your screen, is strengthening the regional evidence base on migration, capacity development, and ensuring more evidence-based IOM and UN-wide engagement. Since uh, RDH began, we've been looking for partners and working with groups and organizations that deal with migration data in the region and even beyond. We also work closely and with and support our country offices in the region with things related to these objectives. The RDH, as we said, is in the process of creating evidence base. So in that process, we are creating a body of work that includes both detailed reviews of data from individual countries, which we call the National Secondary Data Review, and a broader review covering the entire region, the Regional Secondary Data Review. Additionally, we conduct studies on specific themes related to migration, which adds depth to our research effort. Our aim is to enhance our capacities, capabilities, and help others do the same. And our flagship achievement in this endeavor is the annual migration data report. Looking ahead, we are also working to foster more partnerships and expanding our expertise in migration data within the region. Now, we cannot explain our work without talking about our thematic pillars. So at RDH, our work revolves around six main thematic pillars that cover various aspects of migration. These pillars help us to identify and establish connection between migration data and the corresponding SDGs, as well as the objectives of the GCM. We believe that this approach will be beneficial for individuals working in migration-related fields and policymakers who aim to understand the link between migration and these key global frameworks related to both migration and development. And you will definitely observe in the report the clear correlation between these entities. As mentioned earlier, among RDH's effort to strengthen the regional evidence based on migration, we have developed the flagship publication, the Asia-Pacific Migration Data Report. The Migration Data Report 2022 is, as Sarah said, and Coco, is the third volume in the series. The report attempts to thoroughly analyze the ongoing migration dynamics in Asia Pacific, and its purpose is to, is to offer comprehensive recommendations on both policy and data that reinforce the evidence base on migration in the region. The report captures a notably significant period. As the year 2022 marked crucial milestone within international and regional agendas tied to migration, including the 20th anniversary of the Bali process, the introduction of the action agenda on uh, internal displacement, and the progress de declaration of the first IMRF or International Migration Review Forum. Within this context, the report compiles the latest evidence from across the region, accessing regional initiatives and progress towards the achievement of global goals in this specific year. And this year's uh, MDR is special because for the first time, we have invited migration experts to share their knowledge about various migration data topics. By adding their insight, the report aims to make the evidence about migration in the region even stronger. And we will hear some of them today in this webinar. So without wasting any time, it's time for me to hand over the floor to the RDH analysis team to dive into the report with greater and interesting details. So over to you, Annie and team. 
Thank you very much, Shandan. In the following presentation, my colleagues and I will walk you through some of the key report findings by thematic pillar. Looking into our first pillar, migration statistics, analysis of the desert data suggests that by the end of 2022, total population in the Asia Pacific region was projected to reach 4.4 billion, comprising around half of the world population. And this number is expected to continue to grow until the 2050s, despite at a decreasing rate. Population change at the regional level is simultaneously driven by natural change and net migration in opposite directions. With a significant but slowing surplus of births over deaths and a steady surplus of emigration over immigration. This is especially prominent among countries with young populations such as Pakistan, Bangladesh, Philippines, and Pacific Island countries. Underneath this overarching regional trend lie diversities. In particular, for many high-income economies in Asia and the Pacific, immigration was projected to contribute to partially offsetting high levels of population decline due to natural decrease over the next few decades. Now, when it comes to global frameworks related to migration statistics, the average progress in SDGs may disproportionately exclude some groups with distinct demographic or socioeconomic characteristics such as migrants. Limited data availability could imply that migrants remain largely invisible in official SDG data and progress. Out of 24 SDG indicators recommended for desegregation by migratory status, some internationally comparable data exists for six indicators across the region, but the actual number of countries having such data is still low. For example, earning indicators available for close to half of the Asia Pacific countries, but other education and labor indicators capture far fewer countries. This shows that an increased focus on improving data availability will be crucial to ensuring that SDG commitments to leave no one behind translate into action. Moving on, we reach our second and most wide-ranging thematic pillar, which covers various types of migration that are of particular significance in the region. We'll start with labor migration. Based on country-level analysis of main origins and destinations for which data are available, the findings review a trend of recovery of both the outflow and inflow of labor migration from and to Asia and the Pacific, as well as some emerging paths as the pandemic's impacts began to subside. The outflow of workers abroad has shown robust recovery in 2022, with Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Nepal surpassing pre-pandemic levels, if not reaching record highs. The inflow and stock of migrant workers in some main destination countries in the region also show partial to full resumption. These observed trends correspond to various factors, including the prevailing conditions in the origin and destination countries, such as the volume of opportunities, labor demand for economic recovery and growth, and shifting demographics. In some cases, the outflow of migrant workers was prompted by an increasingly challenging domestic economic environment in origin countries through various shocks. I will now hand over to Jasmine to tell us more about other types of migration. Thank you, Annie. So to give a brief overview of the displacement situation in the region, there's been an overall increase in terms of violence and displacement in the first half of 2022, which has deeply affected civilians all over. So there's close to 13 million people from Asia Pacific countries who are currently displaced due to conflict and violence since last year. So this includes 5.5 million refugees and asylum seekers overall in addition to the 7.3 million internally displaced people that were also reported. So in terms of place of origin, most conflict-induced displacement that occurred in the region was concentrated in both Afghanistan and Myanmar. So these two countries compose a large majority, or 80%, of the stock of asylum seekers and refugees for 2022, and 11% was concentrated in just three countries between China, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and Pakistan. So between these five countries, we can capture 91% of the total stock of refugees and asylum seekers for 2022, well, mid-2022. Um, as for the host countries, regionally speaking, so Pakistan, Bangladesh, and the Islamic Republic of Iran were also among the largest countries of, of, of asylum, accounting for close to two-thirds of all refugees and asylum seekers hosted in Asia-Pacific. 
So this can be explained since the large majority of people who flee take refuge in a neighboring country that happen to be in a low or lower middle income country, which is often unable to shoulder the influx of newcomers, both in terms of resources and support. So this last point really highlights the relevance of how development enters the conversation in terms of both its importance and consideration for better migration management. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmine. And now when it comes to environmental migration, in 2022, disasters led to over 22 million displacements in the region, accounting for 70% of the global number of displacements, which make the Asia Pacific region the most prone to disasters. Uh, looking at the country level, as we all know, in 2022, Pakistan experienced an unprecedented flooding, which triggered over 8 million displacements. China recorded more than 2 million displacements just in two major flooding events, and the Philippines, 3 million after the tropical cyclone pine made landfall in October. Countries like Afghanistan, Indonesia, and Tonga uh, face um, geophysical hazards, causing a displacement of around half a million people. Looking at return migration, by the end of 2022, IOM assisted over 6,200 migrants to voluntary return to 26 countries of origin in the Asia and the Pacific region. And while the majority of these cases were male adults, 16% corresponded to female adults and over 340 cases were child returnees. Uh, one key finding I would like to highlight here, colleagues, is that uh, over three quarters of all IOM assisted returnees hosted in the region were intra regional returns. Uh, now, when it comes to compulsory return, more than 13,000 nationals from the region returned from European countries following an order to leave in 2022. Cyprus uh, reports the largest number of nationals uh, from the region, followed by Sweden, France, Romania, and Greece. Uh, here, I, will ask, I would like uh, to also mention that the deportation of Afghan nationals from European countries significantly decreased by two thirds, from 3,000 cases in 2021 to only uh, 1,000 cases in 2022. Thank you, Gabriela. So as we know, irregular migration is a dynamic phenomenon, one that intersects migrants' entry, stay, and work in a country. IOM data monitoring travel document falsification in airports and land crossing points revealed that some countries in the Asia Pacific region experienced a relative increase in their share of imposter cases and fraudulent documentation in 2022. Interestingly, the use of fraudulent documents in travel and migration during the COVID-19 pandemic has changed. And uh, an IOM study focusing specifically on medical fraudulent documentation revealed that many documents fraud while traveling and migrating consist in certificates of entry, quarantine documents, COVID-19 test results, or COVID-19 vaccination proofs. It is also not worthy to mention that most of these people using fraudulent documents in the region were actually uh, nationals from Asia Pacific countries. Our report also looked at human smuggling, that despite its irregular nature, is often not a cause of irregular migration, but rather a symptom of it, and a symptom that largely results from insufficient opportunities to migrate regularly. This obviously paves the path for an increasingly lucrative and under police market of smuggling, particularly in countries such as Afghanistan and Myanmar. Now, let's move on to the migration and vulnerability section. Although the role of the COVID-19 pandemic is not as prominent as it was during its outbreak, its effects are still felt unequally across different population groups, and they make reality harsher for those migrants who were already vulnerable before the pandemic itself. This year, our report focused a lot on migrants' workers' vulnerabilities. And that's because in Asia-Pacific countries, many migrant workers have denounced unfair and unlawful recruitment and working conditions in popular destinations. 
Unfortunately, however, migrant workers' vulnerabilities do not stop in their work sphere and also translate into housing and health issues, with many migrant workers living in poor housing conditions and some still unable to access COVID-19 vaccines. Lastly, looking at the vulnerabilities of forcibly displaced people, the situation in Myanmar and Afghanistan remains critical, as people in need have increased by almost 11 million in Myanmar and by around 6 million in Afghanistan in only one year, from 2021 to 2022. Now, one interesting aspect that this year's report focused on is the burden of debt after return. We all know that return represents a crucial step of the migration cycle and that, especially when combined with debt, it can increase migrants' vulnerabilities and protection risks. Indeed, returnees often report stress, stigma and shame because of indebtedness. And interestingly enough, returnees with large debts actually have no realistic prospects of paying off their debts without remigrating, restarting then another migration cycle. Now over to my colleague, Gabriela. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. Moving on to the next theme on trafficking in persons. In 2022, a new trafficking trend was identified related to online scamming in Southeast Asia, where thousands of victims were being, have been held against their will and forced to work in sophisticated cyber scams. And it has been reported that these online scamming centers bring victims from all over the world including Europe, West Africa, and even as far as South America. And based on data collected through IOM operations in 2022, um, countries like Cambodia, Myanmar, and Laos have moved from being countries of origin of victims of trafficking to become countries of destination, with Thailand as a leading transit country. And now, given the clandestine nature of these um, operations, the number of victims involved in this type of crime has been difficult to, to determine. However, uh, data from IOM's case call of assisted victims provide an important window for all of us to understand this new trafficking trend. And around 300 persons have been identified as victims relating to exploitation in online scamming centers. 68% um, were men and the majority older than 18 years old. Um, also looking at the profiles of the victims, uh, most tend to be multilingual skills and uh, with secondary and higher education. But as a result of the economic recession in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have observed that a full cohort of middle-class workers that normally would be in traditional able to find employment in their countries were forced to work in these criminal operations. Over to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Gabby. So now briefly on migrant deaths and disappearances, which we'll have a chance to hear more through Julia, who is here with us as an expert on the subject, I would just like to highlight some key figures. So firstly, there was 727 reported migration incidents that took place in the region. Also in 2022, a total of 1,000 individuals were reported in Asia-Pacific countries who died or disappeared in transit, which is around 17% of the global figure that stands at over 5,000. Additionally, over 1,100 victims who were originally from the region died globally during their migration journey. So most of these deaths occurred in the region, and 9% of whom were children. So it's important to keep in mind that these figures are a minimum estimate based on indirect sources such as social and traditional media. And because of this, it makes clear that there's an urgent need for improving official data collection activities, especially by national governments, for the purpose of better data and information on missing migrants. Thank you, Jasmine. So moving on, it has been well established that migration represents a crucial aspect of development. But beyond showing the important development nexus between diasporas and remittances, this year, we also wanted our report to explore other areas to which diasporas contribute, such as health and climate action. Indeed, diaspora youths are among the first to respond when natural disasters take place in their countries of origin. And it is precisely thanks to their unique perspective on the consequences of climate change that they can use their transnational networks to raise awareness and support uh, across countries. 
For example, the Pakistani and Bangladeshi diasporas have contributed largely to disaster response in their countries of origin after climate-related crisis. In the same way, several medical diasporas in the region offer medical support through training, virtual assistance during medical operations, and also economic contributions to medical entities, both in their countries of origin and abroad. Now over to my colleague Annie to discuss remittances progress throughout 2022. Thank you, Barbara. Analysis of World Bank's estimates show that the Asia Pacific region received remittance inflows of 310 billion US dollars, nearly 40% of the world total. The largest recipients within the region were India, China, Philippines, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Notably, remittance flows to India were expected to grow to 100 billion US dollars, making the country the first ever to reach this threshold. SDG Target 10.C calls for reducing the transaction costs to less than 3% of migrant remittances and eliminating corridors with costs higher than 5%. The Asia Pacific region has shown progress in this regard. As of the third quarter of 2022, 53% of observed corridors with Asia Pacific countries as the destinations had average costs of less than 5%. Despite progress, remittance costs in many corridors in the region remain above 10%. Moving on to another thematic pillar, migration and innovation. The emergence of digital technologies is among the five megatrends that will shape progress towards the 2030 agenda, according to the UN Economist Networks. Amid this data revolution, innovation and technology hold enormous potentials that can be leveraged to promote the agenda of the SDGs and global compacts for migration. The first aspects of such linkage we've looked into is government initiatives that mobilize innovative data sources and methods for migration statistics. In Asia and the Pacific, the use of big data mostly remains at an experimental phase, but some national statistical offices are integrating them into the production of official statistics. The use of mobile phone data for migration and mobility related statistics generally and specifically in the context of disaster and crisis response has been seen in countries such as Indonesia, China, Republic of Korea, New Zealand and Australia, alongside other types of data sources such as sales tax data and geospatial data. In addition, the pandemic necessitated and fostered the adoption of new data collection methods often facilitated by digital technology, such as in Bangladesh and Philippines, against the backdrop of wider international efforts to modernize the census processes and national statistical systems. I'll now hand over to Jasmine to tell us more about innovation for migration development. Thanks, Annie. So as mentioned, data solutions take various forms and present many opportunities and pitfalls for migrants on the move, some of which are presented here. So new research methods and data solutions can substantially benefit public migration policies and humanitarian operations in areas such as forecasting, scenario analysis, and modeling of migration trends. However, all of these initiatives on record often depend on readily available, comprehensive, quality migration information. Additionally, there are some important challenges to effectively use innovative sources of information. Some of the notable obstacles that we've observed include the difficulty of accessing private data repositories and the lack of technical capabilities to process and analyze the data. Over to you, Gabby. Thank you, Jasmine and Annie. Uh, well, now finally moving on to our last pillar, migration and policy. This third edition of the report brings the topic of migrant rights. And before I begin to present our findings, let's all remember that the international human rights framework applies to everyone within a country, including migrants and their families. So how we can assess that migrants are enjoying such rights? Well, um, the extent to which migrants enjoy or have access to their rights can be evaluated from two perspectives in principle and in practice. And one of the ways to assess a migrant's access to rights in principle is by looking at countries' ratification of the core international human rights treaties. And based on the latest data, all countries in the region have ratified to at least two treaties out of the 18 human rights treaties. Mongolia leads with 73 ratified treaties, followed by New Zealand with 15, 
and Australia, the Maldives, the Philippines, Sri Lanka with 14 ratified treaty each. And also, while uh, all treaties signed in the report include migrant rights, um, the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Their Families directly oversees migration. And as February 2023, only six countries in the region have uh, ratified to this treaty, with Fiji being the latest country to become a member in 2019. Next slide, please. And now, from a practical standpoint, Migrant rights can be uh, assessed by looking at the number of observations and recommendations resulting from the dialogue between the states and treaty committees. Here, colleagues, I want to emphasize that this dialogue is normally initiated by states, showing their commitment to the treaties that they have ratified and assumed legal um, obligation. These observations and recommendations provide practical guidance to states for the implementation of the rights specified in core human rights treaties. And between 2006 and 2022, over 1,100 observations and recommendations on migrant rights have been published, placing the region a second after the economic European area. And at the country level, the Philippines and Sri Lanka had the largest number of observations and recommendations. But here, I will also also like to highlight, to be clear, that having a higher number of observations or recommendations does not necessarily reflect a better or worse implementation of migrant rights, but it might help us to understand the degree of an active engagement initiated by state parties uh, with human rights committees in implementing and granting rights to migrants. Uh, well, this brings us to our conclusion. While COVID-19 might no longer be the main driver behind migration as in previous years, its repercussions have left lasting indirect consequences in the region. But we also have seen renewed commitments to address new challenges that have arisen during this transition to this current post-pandemic world that we live in now. Disaggregated, representative and international comparable data are fundamental for uh, evidence-based policies in the region. And as we have noted, uh, there are still significant data gaps and limitations. However, we can also agree that the knowledge can be provided by exploring, by studying, by analyzing the data that is available. And the Migration Data Report 2022 has done just that. Colleagues, uh, let's all remember that the findings presented today uh, are not just numbers. These, uh, these finders, uh, in, behind each figure, there is a story of migration to tell. And every single of these million of migrants' stories is unique, which shows the diverse, the complex, and always changing migration landscape in the region. Thank you, thank you very much for your attention. And we invite you all to have a closer look to the report for more information about the topics we had discussed today. Now I will hand over to our moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you to the RDH team for sharing with us the key findings on migration data in the Asia Pacific region. Wow, a lot to take on, but glad to know that it is all collected in a digestible report format. So today we're honored to have three keynote speakers joining us who all share insights on the importance and potential of strengthening the regional evidence base for migration. Our first speaker is Dr. Petra Namias. Petra heads the Population and Social Statistics section of the UNSCAP Statistics Division, leading work on a range of topics, including civil registry and vital statistics, gender statistics, migration statistics, and data integration. She has worked in both international and national statistical systems for nearly 20 years and holds a PhD in sociology and demography. Petra contributed to the MDR 2022 by discussing international recommendations on migration statistics in the context of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Dr. Ni Namias, uh, you have the floor. 
thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and congratulations on the launch of the report. Um, I was very uh, honoured and pleased to have been invited to have contributed to the report um, and to be able to present here some of the work on, um, on official statistics related to migration. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So to start off, um, I want to highlight why official statistics are so important for understanding migration and the barriers which exist. Uh, fortunately, this resonates very well with the points raised by the, the previous speakers. Um, firstly, public trust is essential for the credibility of government institutions, especially when it comes to a politically charged topic like migration. Transparency and trust in data collection, analysis, and uh, dissemination builds trust among citizens and organisations. And at the same time, trustworthy statistics bolster public confidence in government actions and policies. So investing in, in official statistics is really a win-win situation. Secondly, uh, official statistics adhere to standardised data collection methods and quality control procedures. This high quality enhances the credibility of any analyses using them. And as a result, policymakers rely on these high quality statistics to make informed decisions that affect various sectors of society. And these statistics then contribute to the creation of effective and targeted policies. And this leads to the third point that the, the valuable insights which are provided as a result. Official statistics offer insights into broad aspects of society, including health, education, um, and so on, and help to understand trends, identify opportunities, and address challenges. Furthermore, governments have committed to international agreements and goals such as the SDGs and the Global Compact on Migration and on Refugees. And official statistics can help measure the progress towards these commitments, ensuring accountability on both a global and a regional scale. So accurate statistical data helps countries assess their achievements and identify any areas requiring attention. Um, official statistics are also a government responsibility. Makers and represent a level of government ownership in the statistics, which is all the more important for potentially marginalised non-citizen populations. Finally, comparable and standardised official statistics enable cross-country and regional comparisons and foster collaboration, knowledge sharing and the adoption of successful policies across borders. So what are the challenges that, that exist? Um, first, when it comes to mobile or transient and hard to reach populations, sometimes involving some complex humanitarian situations, it can be difficult to ensure quality while making sure that these populations are not excluded. Some of the traditional sources of official statistics, such as censuses, surveys or administrative data, might not be fully fit for purpose in this case. And it's a challenge to fit some of the non-traditional sources, as mentioned um, in the earlier presentation, within the standard quality frameworks of official statistics. Migration data often sits within several line ministries and agencies and sharing is essential for the effective production of official statistics. However, this can also often be a challenge due to privacy concerns, legal and regulatory constraints, lack of incentives um, and just technical organisational barriers. And while one of the key advantages of official statistics is that they are meant to be objective and independent from political influence, in practice, this isn't always the case. There may be pressure to directly manipulate or suppress data, but also inadvertently through, for example, push for timeliness at the expense of accuracy or other aspects of quality or funding or resource allocation to collect statistics on a population in which the government may be less interested or actually have um, actively be uh, acting against. Finally, there is often a barrier with lack of harmonisation, preventing comparability between countries or sometimes even within countries. And this could be due to uh, diverse data sources, methodological differences, cultural and contextual factors and, and simply a lack of standardisation. Uh, next slide, please. So to address these challenges, uh, internationally agreed upon recommendations and guidance for official statistics uh, addressing the entire statistical business process model, including data collection and processing, analysis, dissemination and use can be very helpful. So in that regard, we will look at two today at uh, two key groups related to supporting official statistics on migration. 
One of these is the, uh, the expert group on migration statistics, and the other is the expert group on refugee IDP and statelessness statistics. I could talk about this all day, but since I have little time, I'll give you just a taster of some of what these groups do. But I would encourage you to look further in your own time as these groups have been very productive and there's a lot of interesting material which has either been produced or is in the process of being produced and lots of points where you actually also get involved with the process. Next slide, please. Um, can you just click through the animation? So it comes up. Thanks. Um, the expert group on migration statistics is made up of uh, experts in the field of migration statistics from various organizations and line ministries. Uh, the group began in uh, 2017 to discuss the data needs and methodologies related to statistics on international migration. And previously, the recommendations have been from 1998, so they were in dire need of, uh, uh, of an update. Uh, the UN Statistical Commission recommended that this expert group work to improve statistics on international mi migration by revising these uh, outdated recommendations on statistics of international migration and assess the data gaps and national needs for capacity development. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, a number of task forces were set up to look at different aspects of migration statistics. Um, these task forces have looked at um, a new conceptual framework for migration statistics, which I'll show in the next slide, uh, developing guidance on a set of core and additional topics and indicators needed to address key policy issues that are relevant for international migration, producing technical materials to integrate data at the macro and micro level, developing recommendations for improving the quality and availability of statistics on international migration and temporary mobility to help national statistical systems produce comparable data across countries, and also compiling best practices and recommendations for countries producing or planning to produce uh, such statistics. Um, and finally, they also have a task force which is looking at uh, developing a global program on migration statistics, which will strengthen the systems of collecting, managing, compiling and using migration statistics in a holistic manner. Uh, next slide, please. So the one outcome out of the many I wanted to highlight, because this really unpin underpins the work of the other groups and it's already been adopted, is this conceptual framework for migration statistics. So at the centre, you can see that there's this resident population and within it, there are four sub subpopulations which have been distinguished. And, you know, that's really critical, this distinction between the groups. So they have foreign born foreign citizens, foreign born citizens, native born foreign citizens and native born citizens. Um, you know, and from a policy perspective, to be able to present uh, these statistics and indicators for those four subpopulations separately is highly relevant. And it would be a, you know, a real step forward if we can uh, build the capacity of countries to produce in, uh, indicators and statistics in this way. So from this example, all the later proposed indicators uh, and disaggregations and so on from the pre other task forces are in line with this conceptual framework, which was uh, endorsed by the UN Statistical Commission. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and just as and just as part of this uh, this uh, framework, another key outcome was actually better defining what, what is even meant by an international migrant for statistical purposes and what kind of temporary movement is in the scope of, of the work. For example, the work explicitly excludes international temporary mobility indicators related to tourists or business travel. Uh, these flows are almost always treated separately from a policy perspective and are considered fundamentally different from other types of international temporary movements. So getting agreement that this is what's in scope and this is what is out of scope then allows, um, for example, for the statistics to be comparable between countries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a separate but connected initiative is the work of the expert group on refugees, internally displaced people and statelessness statistics known as EGRIS. This group was established by the Statistical Commission in 2016 to provide guidance on the development uh, on, first on uh, international standards for collecting, compiling and analysing data on refugees, and then later expanded to IDPs and to stateless people. The group also seeks to promote the use of these standards by national and international organisations, governments and other stakeholders involved in the management of forced displacement and statelessness. Next slide, please. 
So IGRIS has developed and published um, international recommendations of refugee statistics, and, and that was followed by international recommendations on, uh, on IDP statistics um, to help countries and international organisations uh, to harmonise and improve the quality of statistics on these population groups. IGRIS is now focused on rolling out and supporting the implementation of these recommendations. Um, and uh, to that pattern, it's, it's established three technical subgroups to work on promoting and disseminating the recommendations, capacity building and knowledge sharing, and refinement of a what they've called a compiler manual, which is really a, an operationalization of the, the recommendations. Um, furthermore, to uh, enhance the quality and accessibility of statistics and stateless populations, EGRIS has collaborated with um, uh, and several regional and international organisations to establish some uniform standards and uh, definitions. And these uh, recommendations on statelessness statistics were approved by the Statistical Commission um, in 2021. So the adoption of all these recommendations paves the way for implementation in different countries and supporting the national statistical offices in integrating the statistical standards and definitions into surveys, censuses, administrative data and any other non-traditional uh, data sources. Next slide, please. So as with the, the migration statistics group, I wanted to highlight one of the refugee recommendations um, with the key successes. And it, it's very simple, but this is really uh, a step forward. Um, and especially for the refugee statistics where nothing had, had really existed before. And this has been the adoption of a clear statistical framework for refugee statistics, which can really be implemented in, in all countries uh, and in all different contexts. You can see that there, there are three main groups. Uh, one is people in need of international protection. So clearly this would include asylum seekers and refugees. But given the complexity of different contexts and the need for a uniform framework, it also includes other groups uh, such as uh, prospective asylum seekers. So that might be people who have entered a country with the intent to apply for asylum, but haven't yet done so. So the extent to which this is um, uh, an issue in countries will, will vary depending on their asylum uh, processes. Um, there's another group which is uh, those who may have received temporary protection. And again, this depends on the processes in countries because this would actually cover the Syrian refugees in Turkey who have been given temporary protection. But then there are countries um, who may have a policy interest in statistics and other related populations. So, for example, there's a, a group uh, which is called persons with a refugee background. So that might include naturalized former refugees or children born to refugee parents. So not every country would collect statistics on this group, but they would be in the scope of the recommendations if they, they did so. Policy interest is people who've returned origin who would be uh, collecting statistics on this group and that would include uh, former refugees or returning asylum seekers and so on. Uh, next slide please. Um, so in this presentation I've really just scratched the surface of the work of these uh, two important groups but I hope I've given you a, a flavour of what they do uh, and, and why and I hope also an appetite to explore their work for, further uh, to help improve the evidence base on migration from official statistics. So thank you very much for your attention. Congratulations again on the launch of the report and I'll hand back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Petra, for your insights and for highlighting some of the important international recommendations on official uh, migration statistics in the context of the 2030 agenda. We will now hear from the second keynote speaker, Ms. Pepi Kiviniemi Siddiq. Pepe is the senior regional my regional specialist for protection at the IOM at IOM's uh, Asia Pacific uh, regional office in Bangkok, Thailand. In this role, she supports the IOM missions in the region on IOM's migration migrant protection portfolio, ranging from addressing modern slavery issues in labor supply chains, counter trafficking, assistance to migrants in vulnerable situations to return and reintegration assistance to vulnerable migrants. Prior to joining the regional office, Pepe was working with IOM in Bangladesh, coordinating the missions for Inga humanitarian response in, in the country, as well as managing projects for 
awareness to sustainable reintegration of victims of trafficking. Pepe has also worked as a journalist with the Dow Jones uh, Newswires and the Wall Street Journal in both London as well as Brussels. She holds a master's in comparative politics and a bachelor's in international relations, both from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Over to you, Pepe, for your remarks. Thanks, Tawanda, for that thorough uh, introduction. <laughs> and congratulations, Data Hub colleagues, for our launch of a great report. And thank you for giving me this space to, to further explore some of the data challenges that, that we're facing. And with that, we can go to the next slide, please. So I want to focus a little bit but we can, uh, on, can we go to still the, the question mark? Uh, I want to focus a little bit on why do we still lack strong trafficking data. Um, for IOM in particular, trafficking is often at the far end of the sliding scale of migration for where we start from safe and ethical and when we end up in the most vulnerable and, and trafficking situations. And so we really look at this from the migration lens. But it is notoriously difficult to, to collect trafficking data that's in any way accurate, mostly due to the nature of, of the crime, which is very personal, causes a lot of fear and hurt in the individuals, and so really raises a lot of barriers to, to reporting, as well as it's sometimes a little bit politicized. Um, however, as practitioners in the, in the trafficking world, we do, of course, need an evidence base to know whether what we're doing is working to understand the scale of the problem, to understand where we should be directing our resources. And a little bit, unfortunately, uh, the way that we've agreed that this makes the most sense is to look at the prevalence of trafficking. So perhaps the only globally agreed indicator on how we're doing in trafficking is based on the SDG 16, which measures, measures the number of victims of human trafficking per 100,000 population. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time discussing why it is so difficult to collect this number and why perhaps we should be focusing on a slightly broader set of indicators and come together as practitioners to, to think about this differently. I think the journalist hat also helps because, of course, as a journalist, we always wanted to have numbers and, and hard data. And I think it takes a lot to educate us away from just talking about the numbers to talking about the vulnerabilities, the services, and, and thinking about this a bit differently. But with that, we can go to the next slide. So some of the key uh, challenges in when we are really trying to gather trafficking data is, is linked to really this fact that trafficking is perpetrated mostly by, by transnational organized criminal entities. And, and there are connections to authorities, to law enforcement authorities, to, to communities of origin. And there's a lot of fear amongst the victims that would stop them from coming forward or wanting to be identified, and particularly fear of retribution would stop individuals from being identified. There's also huge lack of awareness on, on what is trafficking amongst those who would be at the front lines of identifying trafficking. It's often reported as something else, as a, a fairly striking example, for example, but in 2022, New Zealand had no cases of trafficking reported by the state authorities at all. Of course, they did have cases of sexual exploitation and forced labour, but enforcement to file cases or something else because it makes the investigations easier, um, as well as that reluctance by victims to come forward. There's also varying definitions, particularly in Asia Pacific, in terms of amongst our governments on what they consider trafficking. And this is particularly clear when it comes to, to issues of labour trafficking, which are easily identified as labour exploitation instead of trafficking, or when it comes to trafficking for forced criminality, where we've seen, for example, now during the most recent case of trafficking to, to these online scamming centers, that often the victims are identified as irregular migrants instead of potential victims of trafficking. Another area where trafficking is rarely identified is, is forced marriage. Um, and then there are, of course, also some discrepancies amongst the data collection methods. It's the data harmonization in terms of how we are collecting trafficking information through NGOs, through governments, to other practitioners can be quite varied. And so it's difficult to know if we're comparing apples to apples or to something entirely different. And next slide, please. So just to illustrate some of the data discrepancy when we are focusing on numbers and prevalence, and, and of course, I mean, both of the reports that are up on the slide are great reports that add a lot of value, particularly in terms of the qualitative aspects of, of what's happening in the world of trafficking and exploitation uh, for us to understand trends and vulnerabilities. But when we're talking about hard numbers, so if we look at the uh, Global Estimates of Modern Slavery, which is an IOM, ILO and walk-free publication, and it just came out in 2022, the most recent one, it identified a 23 
3% increase from 2016 in modern slavery. And it looks at uh, forced labor, it looks at forced marriage and, and a few other indicators of trafficking. Um, and it collects data from the UN, from NGOs, it does surveys in countries. So it has quite a wide set of, of data sets that it collects. Then we have the UNODC Global Report on Trafficking in Persons from 2022, which I think identified an 11% decline in trafficking in persons. But of course, the UNODC report only collects data from government sources, only from government identified uh, sources in terms of who are victims of trafficking. And again, for example, we saw a decline in government led identifications from uh, low to middle income countries, not necessarily because there were fewer victims of trafficking, but because also during the COVID years, resources from victim identification were pulled away and went into other types of work. And so it just showcases that when we're really focusing on the numbers, on the prevalence numbers, we are not necessarily really understanding what's going on in the world of trafficking. And we need a wider net to, to kind of build our case for, for what needs to happen. So next slide with what can we do? Um, there are a few areas where we could broaden our understanding of how we look at trafficking, particularly I think in terms of weighing or giving more weight to qualitative information, whether we have anecdotal information on new corridors, new trends, new vulnerabilities, and really trying to give that emphasis that isn't always given if you don't have the hard numbers to say this is the prevalence in this case. Um, there are also wider data sources that we could be looking into going beyond government statistical data, for example, which we know has gaps in, in what's being collected and including NGO and other service provider information, proxy indicators on what might be victims of trafficking. Of course, then we're running into huge issues around data standardization and harmonization. And we would have to put a lot of effort to ensure that what's being collected uh, is somehow standardized. Beyond numbers, and, and this is something that is already being done, uh, or, for example, by the US State Department and their TIP report, but looking at prosecutions and judgments, looking at amended legislations, looking at victim protection services available to victims. So really understanding, you know, if we do see trafficking in a certain corridor, do we also see prosecutions? And I think a great example, again, is this trafficking for forced criminality that we're seeing right now in this region, where we do see victim numbers, we're not seeing a lot of prosecutions. And so right now, perhaps that's something that we want to start looking at in terms of why not and, and what can be done in that space. I think really the data innovations that are happening elsewhere need to be brought into the trafficking space as quickly as possible, looking at big data, looking at other types of surveys that are being carried out and how we can kind of bring that all together and start building a picture. I think very interesting to start looking at migration patterns and how those map against some of the trafficking data that we do have, looking at immigration data. Um, but of course, sometimes this is difficult in terms of trust. A lot of this data would have to be cross-border and it's difficult to, to share that even when it's not dealing specifically with trafficking. But here again, some of the data innovation that's happening, for example, trying to build synthetic um, data sets based on information that is being shared. And so making it less sort of country specific or victim specific would be very useful. So it takes a lot of cooperation and quite a bit of innovation uh, and a little bit of rethinking as to how we want to look at trafficking data to get us to a place where we where we will have a better picture of this. And with that, I'm going to hand over back to you, Tawanda. Thank you. You are muted, Tawanda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pepe, for the insights on the need for need to support better data collection and improved evidence base to respond to trafficking. We will now hear from the third keynote speaker, Ms. Julia Black. Uh, Julia is based in the Global Data Institute in Berlin, where she coordinates IOM's Missing Migrants Project and is also part of the Mobility Data Lab. For the last seven years with IOM, her work has dealt primarily with migrant deaths and disappearances but also irregular migration, human rights, and data collection on hard-to-reach populations through open source methodologies. Over to you, Julia, for your keynote address. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tawanda, for the introduction. Um, congratulations to the Data Hub for this fantastic report, and thank you all uh, for bearing with me to the very last keynote presentation today. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. 
Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about uh, our work on the Missing Migrants Project, which really centers around documenting deaths and disappearances during migration. You can please go right ahead with the next slide. Um, so our project is the only open access global database um, that is working on this issue. Um, we have a growing number of qualitative research components that complement this on families, on responses uh, to this issue. Um, we have quite a lot of inter uh, of reports analyzing this topic and, and you know, unrelated thematic issues and all of that can be found on our website, which uh, I'm really thankful was already <laughs> linked in the chat. Uh, please go ahead um, to the next slide. So it's it's really important to understand why we do this, um, and I think uh, Petra's <laughs> Petra's presentation um, alluded to the fact that there are very few um, you know official statistics on migration in general um, on missing migrants. There are none. Um, so we really uh, believe that documenting um, these deaths does counter the invisibility of this issue. Um, it's not just isolated incidents. You know, a shipwreck in the Mediterranean is not, uh, uh, you know, an isolated incident. It's it's a pattern, and this pattern is is happening in Asia Pacific and across the world and over time. Um, our data also does inform IOM operations, um, especially with our protection division. Um, and we do provide um, support to families who are searching for a missing relative uh, whenever we can. Um, and then policy-wise at the very international level only, um, the, our data set is used as an SDG indicator, um, the only one measuring unsafe migration, which is called for in the SDGs, and the Global Compact for Migration, uh, which also has an entire objective centered around this topic. Please go ahead to the next slide. Um, it's important to understand a bit before I get into our, our findings from this report, um, what our data is really talking about. Um, so we really narrowly define this issue somewhat um, to deaths and disappearances that happen en route. So a body is found at an international border, um, a person goes missing at sea, those cases are included in our database. Um, what is not included it is many other types of, of migrant who may have gone missing. This includes deaths um, that may have happened in detention or reception centers, um, this also, you know, includes deaths of labor migrants. Um, I'm a migrant myself. If I die here in Germany, I'm not going to be included in the Missing Migrants Project data set. Um, we don't include any deaths related to internal displacement. Um, and of course, there is a huge number of people who go missing um, and are hopefully not dead, um, but they are missed by their families. And that is also unfortunately not included in our data set. Please go ahead to the next slide. Um, because there are no uh, federal statistics on missing migrants uh, per our definition, um, we rely on quite a number of different sources of data. Um, this does mean that our data is, is best understood as kind of a minimum estimate of the true number. We know that what we are capturing is incomplete. Um, so we do work with local authorities primarily, um, this can include police, coast guards, um, people working with the remains, so uh, coroners, medical examiners, and so on to collect data. Um, we're really thankful to, I think, many colleagues and, and partners online right now um, who send us data because they're working operational with migrants, with survivors who have witnessed a death. Um, and then we do collect surveys. We're piloting a few with the IOM's displacement tracking matrix. Um, in the Americas and Africa right now um, to, to basically capture eyewitness reports of these deaths um, because there are many inhospitable regions where that is simply the only source of data we have on this. Um, and then we do also um, use open source intelligence, so social and news media monitoring. We have a couple of different tools that we use. All that is collected by our colleagues in regional offices. It feeds into an internal database. We verify it by reaching out to um, basically our, our key informants, these kind of top four uh, NGOs to government authorities. Um, and then that's published twice a week. Uh, so our data is really timely. Please go ahead to the next slide. Um, you can see here the, the number of deaths 
Um, we've recorded worldwide as of uh, about 10, 12 days ago. Um, so you can see, obviously, the Mediterranean is quite dominant and there are quite a few Asian Pacific nationals who do die or go missing at sea there. Um, but you can also see that there are, you know, a, a record breaking number of deaths um, last year. And I will get into in, in within the region of Asia um, last year and I'll get into that um, in just a moment. Please go ahead. So um, within the Asia Pacific region, which that 1000 number looks a bit different than the slide before because we include Western Asia uh, in the prior slide. Um, but you can see we recorded uh, 1000 deaths last year. Um, quite a lot of them were in Southwestern Asia um, as well as Southeastern Asia. Um, I will say that um, our data is incomplete, we know that, and so a lot of these shifts over time are due actually to the availability of data sources, um, and the availability of these data sources is really um, influenced by kind of crisis situations. So you can see 2014-2015, there were a huge number of deaths recorded in Southeast Asia. Um, this is because of the Rohingya crisis, um, where there were many incidents involving deaths um, of Rohingya at sea in the Bay of Bengal and Andaman Sea. Um, the UNHCR did an absolutely incredible investigation trying to document um, the deaths uh, that occurred there. But since then, there really hasn't been as robust data um, on deaths of Rohingya. Uh, so we can jump to the next slide um, and I'll talk. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the deaths and disappearance of Afghans, which made up uh, the majority of deaths in the region uh, last year. So since um, 20, late 2021, um, when the Taliban takeover occurred, um, there were a huge number of deaths, more than 700 that year, of people attempting to leave the country. Um, this, you can see cumulatively, this includes quite a lot of deaths in Iran and at um, Afghan's external borders, also some in Turkey as well. Um, and that does include some like sea deaths that happened just off the coast there. Um, I will say that this, you know, the fact that, for example, there are no deaths in Pakistan recorded um, or other, you know, destination countries of Afghans is, is due to the data sources that we do have available. Um, so we, most of our data on Afghan deaths comes from um, bodies that are actually repatriated. Uh, so if we don't have data from a certain country on that, that data is missing from our database. Um, please go ahead to the next slide. Um, and then the other kind of main population in our, in our data set is the deaths and disappearances of Rohingya. So you can see again that 2015, that investigation led to a wealth of data um, on, on this terrible topic. Um, this last year, we did see again um, an increase in shipwrecks of people um, leaving Myanmar. Um, many of these are due to drowning, um, but because we don't have the resources to do this kind of incredible dedicated investigation like UNHCR did in 2015, um, it is my belief, and I, I've heard this echoed by many people, that many more uh, Rohingya go missing than we know about at the moment. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so just briefly on the data gaps, again, um, we don't have data on official sources at the federal level. Um, I think Jasmine also alluded to this in, in her presentation on, uh, slide on this, that um, the vast majority of our data comes from basically key informants who are not official actors. Um, this means both that it, it can mean two things. It means that governments in Asia are not collecting data on this issue, of course, but it also means that um, there is perhaps a, a concern by migrants, by survivors, by their families, that they are not able to safely report these cases. Um, it's obviously um, the vast majority of these cases occurred during um, irregular movements. And so, you know, there's also a very high likelihood that many remains are never recovered at all. And those are just completely invisible in our data set. Um, and beyond the data that, again, is our, our kind of narrow definition of this topic, um, we really don't have good data on 
um, the impact of this issue on the families, on the communities um, that are recovering bodies that have a missing loved one. Um, and then, of course, there are many other cases, I think, especially in Gulf countries of Asians, Asian nationals um, who may go missing in the context of labor migration as well. Please go to the next slide. And I think that's it for me, but there's my contact information and our website, which again, I think our next data update will be this evening um, if you're interested in 2023 data as well. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for your insights on the need to have better data to inform policy and programming to ensure safe migration for all within the Asia Pacific region. It's now time to hand over again to Chandan to share with us another exciting product of the RDH. Uh, Chandan, over to you. Thanks, Tawanda. Yeah, exciting indeed. Uh, a moment that we have been eagerly waiting for. And after months of collaborative effort, today also marks the unveiling of the RDH website, an innovative uh, interactive portal designed to provide a comprehensive array of migration related information. Now, you may be wondering why another data portal? I would say the answer is twofold. First, migration data in the region is scattered across a variety of sources, including governments, national institutions, UN agencies like us, DESA, UNHCR, IDMC, ILO, and World Bank, to name a few, making it a challenge to access. Second, our focus at RDH is to streamline this information. While our annual MDR is a valuable resource. It's once in a year publication and its structured format may limit accessibility. This is where our website steps in to consolidate essential migration data from diverse sources into a centralized location, ensuring consistent access to reliable information. And the best part, it's designed with interactivity and user friendliness in mind. Moreover, we have embraced an open approach to development, enabling the portal to organically evolve based on user feedback, incorporating new ideas as we progress. So I would not waste any more time. Let's take a moment to watch the introduction video of RDH Interactive Data Portal, which we feel will be a tool that promises to enhance your understanding on migration trends. Over to you. Did you know every one in three international migrants come from the Asia Pacific region? And every one in six international migrants from around the world live in this region? Migration and mobility have long been significant to the social and economic history of Asia and the Pacific. Given the complex, dynamic, and diverse landscape of human mobility in the region, timely, reliable, and comparable data are critical in advancing rights-based and people-centered migration governance. The volume of migration data scattered across numerous sources makes it difficult to accurately locate migration data. To efficiently provide a holistic overview of migration in the region, the IOM Regional Data Hub, or RDH, for Asia-Pacific launches its flagship interactive digital portal. The RDH website provides a unique regional platform that enables policymakers, practitioners, researchers, and the general public to access comprehensive information on migration. The work of RDH is structured in six thematic pillars. Migration statistics, types of migration, migration and vulnerability, migration and development, migration policy, and migration and innovation. On the website, the analyzed data are visualized and presented by thematic pillars to provide trend analysis at the regional, sub-regional, and country level in a convenient solution. 
the interactive website consolidates key migration indicators from various data sources into one central data warehouse. Desegregated data by sex and age are demonstrated whenever available to reflect the diverse needs and challenges that are faced by different groups in vulnerable situations. The IOM Regional Data Hub for Asia and the Pacific works to enhance the availability and consolidation of migration data and promote its use in the region to strengthen the evidence base and broaden the understanding of migration through research and analysis, capacity building, and technical management of IOM's data repository and activities in 40 countries across the region. A consolidated he IOM and non-IOM data on migration into one portal, making migration data accessible to all. Explore the interactive website today.